Hello. I hope you're doing well. This is one grader. My name is Dan. We got a lot to get into tonight. Fortunately, I am a bit late. Feeling quite rough. Not do a show earlier tonight, unfortunately. But I'm here now. We're live. And uh, we got a lot of stories I've curated. Start with the first one out of New Jersey. This is a 129 year old dam in New Jersey in Warren County. The Paulina Dam at five million dollars USD in its demolition. Five million dollars to a dam as we've been going over before. Some of these dams are so old and so dare I use the word decrepit that they are absolute dangers. They are monuments of danger, picking time. After 129 years, this dam is finally destroyed. The project will reconnect 7.6 miles of mainstream and tributary habitat and will be the final step in a three dam removal watershed wide Restoration, Beth Styler, Barry, Director of the Freshwater Program at the Nature Conservancy. Wow. The Nature Conservancy. Got it. Old New Jersey advanced media this week just days after walking the grounds in the same organization which is leading Paulina Dam removal moved the 109 year old Columbia Dam in 2019 about 10 miles away proof of concept came quick in the form of shad that is shad is a fish demolition on the Blairstown Dam be underway as of now after that engineer advocates and tributary experts will monitor and review the land along the waterway to see how the riverbank responds now this is a problem that is becoming far greater of a problem that's Sneaky. It's a danger of aged infrastructure. Some of these dams are over 100 years old and they might not be generating any power to anything anymore. What are they doing? You need to get rid of them. Instead of spending millions of dollars trying to restore a dam that's over 80 years old. Just spend that same amount of money, apparently, just demolish it, have a healthier river eating ecosystem. We don't need dams like we thought we would before. They're making dams everywhere. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of dams. So this uh, dam doesn't look to be very tall, but allowing for it to be able to successfully have spawns of shad and other fish. 
That's a positive thing. Spending money on improving infrastructure by tearing down aged infrastructure. This is a trend I can get behind. Because normally you would hear about a dam being repaired and the amount of money that budgeted for the dam is just quite low. Laughable. There is no money in dam repair. Some of these dams are so full of water they would have to release a lot to be able to be repaired. How much water? What are the effects downstream of the dam? Again, we're talking about dams that have control mechanisms for the water. Not as much as this uh, silt removal. It's these uh, punched up rocks. So, not deep enough to have divers, but still a lot of people are involved in this project, so it's a good thing. It's not, they well, might, might be volunteer. This is a proof of concept, right? After the removal, the lightweight East Coast fish were soon swimming up the Pauline's Kill, New Jersey's third largest tributary to the Delaware River, for the first time in over a century. Get rid of them. There's no sense in having so many dams anymore everywhere. We understand that rivers need to flow. There's a video here. Let's see what this video says. Protected by a large earthen dam from the water that has come down the river and it's, you know, a small reservoir. There was a lot of rain and the dam uh, which is decades old, started to crumble. And it crumbled enough so that, you know, a lot of water started to come over the top. And, you know, the state came in and they evacuated everybody. Um, and I was curious, is like, is this the one-off? And the answer is no. The American Society of uh, Civil Engineers did a report a year ago, and they said there are 15,629 high hazard dams. Now, there are probably 120 years did a report a year ago and they said there are 50 uh, civil the American civil engineers civil engineers last year or did a report a year ago and they said there are 15,000 15, mark at high hazard 15,629 high hazard dams. Now, they're probably not that high a hazard if they're sort of average water level that's behind them, but you're seeing these sudden flash storms now that'll throw six inches of water onto the ground in a matter of hours. I, I think this becomes a much bigger infrastructure problem as climate change causes huge storms. Yeah, absolutely, we forget you know, we're all baking in these heat waves this summer, but uh, the flip side of that is violent thunderstorms and flooding uh, and power outages, for that matter. Um, and the infrastructure in a lot of our um, cities, towns, uh, bridges, dams, everything, highways, um, is in vast need of repair. Government's been trying to do something for the last couple of years. There's money behind it, but it's moving slow. So we just had that big accident in Baltimore, for instance. You know, you don't see dams collapse too often other than in the movies, but they do. And when they do, it's always a tragedy. Like you said, these four folks in uh, Mawawa, uh, you know, had to evacuate. So um, I think we'll see a lot more of that. Those storms, they come when the rain.
So tens of thousands of dams. 15,629 marked as probably uh, a lot of them need to be taken down before that they fail. There's been several dams like the Rapidan Dam that failed, I believe, in Wisconsin. You have the other dam that failed in Illinois. A third dam as well that failed. They just mentioned that video. I can't remember now. Tip of my tongue. Anyway. But there are dams that are seeing repairs. There is a tremendous amount of dams. You can spend all time. You know, trying to find resources regarding dam health. And, uh, dam repairs. This is Oklahoma, Bardsdale Dam gets $2 million grant to fix Waxhoma Dam. The Oklahoma Water Resources Board awarded the Barnsdall, Barnsdall Public Works glory with a $2 million grant to make major repairs at the Waxhoma Dam. Dam spillway is crit damage with a large crack and scattered pieces of concrete as evidence. Two separate dam breaches caused the damage. One happened in 2021. Waxhoma Lake is a source of drinking water for more than 500 customers. In the past, it was also a place for lots of family fun. Smith predicts, once the dam is repaired, people will flock back to the area. I think it's going to be great for the community, Smith said. I think it will allow access back to parts of Lake Waxhoma, Waxhoma that we haven't been able to access. Bill Coleman a state senator added in the release. This is great news. I know that dam has been causing problems. I am pleased that this is going to help Barnstall and water supply. First major improvements coming to the town. Repairs planned for Lake Sequoia Dam. Cherokee Village, Arkansas. Suburban Improvement District SID plans to make repairs to the dam at Lake Sequoia in Cherokee Village. This comes after civil engineers conducted inspections in November of 2023 and found a leak. The lake has been a hot spot for people to visit and enjoy for many years, which is something that we're seeing. Uh, trend. You see lakes, you see people there, tourists or even local people that are flocking to the lakes. We have some lakes in Serbia and Italy that have dried up. You see also dams that have too much water. Any dam that has an earthen dam right now going forward is at risk as we understand it. It could cause tremendous failures that eventually lead to a colossal failure of the dam, like we've seen in Michigan before in Midland. Those dams are still destroyed. No been no repair. No been no field of water. No return to a lake. That's what these 
people are truly trying to keep is that sense of a lake, false sense of reality. Because the lake isn't really there, being dammed up, it is a false lake. And where its floodplains are located, it would be very detrimental to people that live down from the spillway. This, how much will it rain compared to how much water needs to be absent from the dam to be able to make repairs, critical repairs? Very difficult to get budget allocated for dam repairs. This is just so much money. It takes a lot of time. Might be the right time of the year. Also needs to be the right level. Also, all these dams sometimes are way above sea level. I don't think that matters. Work continues to complete repairs on Lake Livingston Dam. Work and repairs on the Lake Livingston Dam. As of Tuesday, the lake level is at 129, speaking of which, 129.81 feet above sea level, above mean sea level. This is it is anticipated that a lake level will fluctuate between 128 and 131 mean above sea mean sea level for the next three weeks. Now the parts of a dam that we focus on failing be the earthen part. Right here, right here, not right here. The built up earth around, let's see, the corner, flop over. The Just like the one we see in Midland, Michigan, this earthen dam. Although there's no risk of this dam, all dams with this kind of earthen feature controlling water and containing it are going to be at risk because that's going to be a huge expansion, temperature changes, and the amount of weight that that dirt, that earth, is packed in and built up over time can hold. And eventually it's going to get top of it and it's going to go over the top of it that water is going to cause physics eventually use it like a saw carving into it or just enough that it can pop it out like a tooth or a glacier a lot of the times the uh, failure that I see in dams the result of the earthen portion of the dam failing. Not the concrete, not the built up metal structures, but the earth packed in earthen side of it. You go, f you go have a storm that drops six to eight inches of water in a few hours, you can't keep up. You'll see dam failures in the earthen part of it. Like we saw in the Rapidan Dam, as well as this uh, Nashville, Illinois. About 200 homes were evacuated in Nashville, Illinois, as a dam failed Tuesday.
too concerned about the text, it's just the amount of water everywhere. It's cars that are just completely inundated. One woman had to be rescued from her home. About 200 homes were evacuated. Terrible, terrible amount of water as climate change adds to the amount of rainfall that a storm, let's say, is going to be anticipated anyway. A storm is not going to be that much more likely to drop an intense amount of rain. We've seen this in the Midwest, we've seen this in the Northeast. Suddenly just six to eight inches of rain falls a short period of time in a very narrow area lead to very catastrophic failures especially of dams but we try to monitor them try to pick up news when we can This is the Three Gorges Dam uh, on the Yangtze River in China. Yichang in China. This is large, one of the largest dams, if not the largest dam in the world. What happens when it rips open? Six floodgates of the Three Gorges Dam were opened. It's going to cause the river to overflow by a lot. Depending on how much water needs to go down before you can stop. Because if you're getting 8 to 12 inches of water, 6 hours, and your dam is 100 and 130 feet above sea level, you're pouring out from 6 uh, floodgates out into the rest of the river river that you're flooding into is going to become much wider than it is tall. So it's going to expand floodplain. As water builds up, it causes more and more territories to flood. I don't mean just like, you know, obvious. I mean, for real. The amount of water that's being unleashed, catastrophic to everybody downstream it's going to burst its riverbanks by a lot to the point that new riverbanks will be gained. Water levels at the reservoir reached over 544 feet. I would say this is the biggest dam I know of. There's other probable Mega dams that are being built, but I think this is the largest in service dam on the planet. I know there is a lot of speculation and theories regarding this dam and the Three Gorges Dam. I remember, people used to be concerned. Three Gorges Dam, the amount of water that it was being let out caused fluctuations in the, the, the planet's orbit. 
we've seen some pretty incredible floods. Just uh, seeing this water being tossed by these, like, the amount of human engineering that it would take, that it requires, in theory, to alter the days would be something more globally widespread and unsettling, like climate change. You want to blame Earth's uh, daylight gains on climate change. The areas of the planet where there's greenhouse gases that are causing greater, greater problems just a measly dam not think that even if we had every dam on the planet firing off all at once all the floodgates that we could alter the spin planet however there be a storm that is so large due to climate change that is so enormous due to widespread ocean warming. We're seeing it now. We don't need to worry about a dam causing effects like the spin of the planet. We're already seeing storms that are category five, like we saw with Hurricane Barrel, that have way more power in every spin compared to floodgates of even the largest dam. There is no contest when it comes to the power of Mother Nature rivaling human engineering. There's no contest right now. Just a dam and it flooding, it opening all its gates even, won't cause the days to be shorter or longer. Again, we have storms that are incredibly much more powerful than this dam. But locally, it's going to cause terrible flooding effects. It's 544 feet on July 14th. So it's 607 feet tall. And the water is 544 feet in the dam. I mean, it, it's not even just like flat all the way across 544, right? Got to be some areas that are shorter than the rest. Can't rely on on dams anymore because it's always going to be a complete struggle in maintaining the water level due to climate change. But one thing that we can walk away from knowing that we are defeated, our dams are defeated. A lot of them were built over a hundred years ago. Even the dams that are built decades ago, still, are they worth the effort? They're worth the risk? What would really happen if we demol uh, demol uh, demolished most of our dams? It's... It's no more that we get so many resources, so much resource from these dams. So many dams that even 
you want to imagine that power of these dams can alter space time, then a lot of little dams going off all together, their floodgates will be able to alter less. They're constantly occurring. We would see days constantly changing, ebbing and flowing along water. Don't think globally that we're in trouble because the Three Gorges Dam opens up. Locally in the greater region, yes, they are in trouble. As is, dam levels become higher and higher each year. It becomes that much more difficult to maintain the dam levels. 544 feet. And it's just over 600 feet. It we really it really doesn't have that much more room to grow, especially whenever you're seeing massive rains put in huge amounts of rain into this area. Quite a big storm going across it right now. These also have effects here. Typhoons, especially this one right here. Come up here. It's still going. Okay, so. Full extent of the storm is here, but So if this storm continues northeast, we'll be looking at massive amounts of rain, especially with a tropical storm just overhead, remnants of it. Soda cans are exploding on southwest flights due to sky high temperatures. This is NPR by Rachel Treesman. Summer temperatures across the US are so high that they've created problems at cruising altitude, causing some overheated beverages to burst midair on a number of Southwest Airlines flights. We have these areas where 110, 120 degrees thermally inside the plane, even being cooled. It's taking in a lot of residual radiation. Being up so high in the air isn't just the heat itself. Flying 
above the clouds or of no clouds, you're taking the full brunt of the sun solar rays or there's reflection or there's mitigation. Dangerous. We do think that flight attendants should be paid more as this is becoming hazardous work, especially as temperatures continue to change rapidly. You have climate change affecting an entire industry, more so than just a glitch. At what point is it unsafe to be in the air with people as passengers in a plane? At what temperature do you need to be? We know there's this established temperature. Helicopters cannot fly over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We know that now. Is there a limit on how a plane can fly when it's 120 degrees? Is there just a lot more turbulence? What? Of course, climate change creates more woes for travelers and just limited beverage choices. It intensifies weather events like floods and storms, makes planes flying harder. It may also be to be to blame bumpier flights. How a woman escaped from the jaws of a 400 pound alligator. Michelle Thompson had to fight for her life after she was attacked by an 11 foot alligator on the 4th of July. See, what happened is that she wanted to cool off on the 4th of July, and it being, you know, you might not be. Thinking their best. You have this this woman. When you're in the water with them, it's different. When you're coming out as she was, just stepping on the stone, the alligator reached out, grabbed her leg. She knew about alligators enough to know that pulled her back in enough. It'll do a death spiral, it'll corkscrew itself, ripping and tearing what it has in its mouth right off the bone. Potentially the whole bone can take the leg. Alligators and crocodiles are extremely powerful in the water, especially when you're not. It has so much more friction to play with or you experience the same as it's spinning. So it's spinning right off the top like this would be absolutely devastating for her survival. Official estimates, official as, officials estimate that about 1.3 million Americans alligators live throughout Florida. Eight unprovoked bites requiring professional attention over the past decade. It's a more human wildlife conflict. How much more can you build before you're starting to encroach on nature? Point that it only knows this area. It doesn't know where else to go. You're building up what is going to happen. The alligators come back, they want to spawn We're in the same areas. There's other ways alligators know it's home, just us building up around it.
still going to try. They're still going to try. So this woman wanting to cool off on the 4th of July took a dip in this river. I don't know if she knew there was alligators in it or not. I don't think she would have jumped in it knowing that there was an alligator that was an 11 foot long, 400 pound monster, pretty much. Prehistoric beast in the water. Sweating in 78 degree temperatures, 93% humidity. Thompson decided to take a dip before waking up her nine year old son and seven year old daughter to make them breakfast. I was literally thinking in my mind, what a beautiful day. I'm going to have a great day with my kids. Then Thompson heard a slight stirring of water and saw a small ripple in her peripheral vision that quickly turned into an alligator head in an almost instant attack. Scar sunk his teeth into her right calf, breaking her fibula. It sounded like potato chips. Thompson screamed, waking up her son in the house. She turned her body and grabbed the nearest rock, but the gator yanked her heart, pulling her away from the shore. Remembering Scar's wound from weeks before, Thompson punched the side of his snout. He counted by jerking her again, pulling her into even deeper waters. The death roll. That's when I just screamed and gave it everything I possibly could, grabbing his top and his bottom jaw and prying as hard as I could. Thompson felt her leg come free and pushed the gator, launching herself away from Scar and onto shore. From start to finish, Thompson estimates that the attack lasted about 30 seconds. That's not much time. Especially an ambush predator. Ambush apex predator. Chances of survival if this thing would have pulled her in would have been low. Within 15 minutes of being bit, Thompson was getting medical care. So the power of an alligator was from that first snap, break bone, rip through flesh. I've seen plenty of crocodiles attack and feed. And you see the legs of the zebra, different animals that are antelope that are trying to get across the river. That first clap from an alligator or I'm sorry, crocodile. Tremendous. It's one of the most powerful bites in the animal kingdom. This woman making a full recovery gladly. After being ambushed by a crocodile, as soon as you lose eye contact with it, it knows. Eyes don't see you the way that you see it. It sees the world much differently. It has so much ambition, so much power. But so much power. Doctors feared they would need two or three surgeries and skin grafts to clean, cover, and close her wound, Thompson said. But once they started working, she said, they determined that although she had a clean fracture to the fibula and loads of muscle damage, the gator hadn't torn off any skin or severed any major nerves. She was released after four days and is expected to make a full recovery.
her the quite a battle that she's been through. Four minute listen regarding the power outages that has plagued uh, Houston. And Hurricane Barrel. Devastating power outages destruction by Hurricane. And underscored the city's inability by itself against against person by Category one hurricane across land. Landfall in Texas. The category one storm left more than two million utility customers without power in the greater Houston area. That was more than a week ago, but thousands still do not have power, and some residents are fed up with the outages. <clears throat> City, county, and state leaders are demanding answers. Porter Stella Chavez with the Texas Newsroom joins us now with an update. Hey, Stella. Hey, it's what, good to be here. What is the situation in Houston right now? How many people are we talking about without power? Well, currently about 3,000 customers in the greater Houston area don't have power. Now that includes the actual number of residents, which is much higher than that. And Centerpoint Energy, the, the greater... utility company that serves most of the residents there, says it would have power restored to all customers by the end of today, Friday. Now, Red Cross mobile teams have been on the ground providing food and water, and the Disaster Relief Organization is also providing shelter to residents who don't have power or AC. This, this was a devastating storm. At least 18 people have died, and there are so many questions now about the power company's response. Walk us through some of the issues that happened here. Well, a lot of residents and elected officials are angry. They say that the company's preparations for the storm weren't adequate and that some preventative measures should have been taken well before the storm, things like trimming tree limbs around power poles. But there's also confusion about who takes care of that. Is it the city's responsibility? Is it Centerpoint's or the residents? And there are also major questions about Centerpoint's generators. The Houston Chronicle reported this week that the company spent $800 million on 20 large generators, but most of them are not being used. I spoke with energy expert Doug Lewin. He writes the Texas Energy and Power newsletter, and he says, well, attention is on Centerpoint, elected officials are also to blame. They've chosen to do things like spend billions of dollars on new gas plants that don't help when there's a hurricane. To allow Centerpoint to spend $800 million on mobile generators, which haven't helped much after a hurricane. So, you know, those are all policy choices. So I think they've got to look in the mirror a little bit too and do a better job setting the regulatory and policy construct to actually serve Texans. Let's talk about Texas Governor Greg Abbott for a moment. There's been a lot of focus on the fact that he was out of the country when the storm hit. What has his reaction been to all of this? Well, you're right. He was criticized for not canceling his trip or even cutting it short. But when he got back, he held a press conference and said Centerpoint had, quote, completely dropped the ball with regard to getting power back on. He also fired off a letter to Centerpoint's CEO, Jason Wells. And in it, he lists items he wants the company to address. He wants them to speed up replacing power poles with more resilient ones before the end of this hurricane season. And the CEO has to submit a plan by the end of the month. If it doesn't, if or if he doesn't, Abbott says he'll deny any request to raise rates and take other steps. Now, while Abbott is pointing the finger at Centerpoint, others are saying his administration could have done more. What about the state energy regulators? Could they have done more? So Governor Abbott also sent a letter to the Public Utility Commission of Texas demanding answers. I talked to Sylvester Turner. He's the former state rep and former mayor of Houston. And he says everyone in leadership needs to do their part, especially with extreme weather being so routine now due to man-made climate change. The reality of the storms are coming with greater frequency and greater intensity, which means preparation, preparation, preparation. All of the parties have a role to play. 
Now, the Utilities Commission has until December 1st to submit its report, and that's before the next legislative session, which begins in January. All right, that's Texas Newsroom, Stella Chavez. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming out of Pakistan, 19 bodies found in areas of Karachi. Ongoing heat. Send Health Department confirms this is attributed to smoke. Karachi is reeling under a heat wave. Eyes and tragic fatalities. <clears throat> Past 24 hours, authorities have covered 90 bodies in Sari. These were identified as drug use, highlighting the marginalized during extreme weather. Found all over. And news coming out of Pakistan, some India, Africa, Africa, out of control, Southwest United States as well, and Mexico, all seeing record smoke and heat. And adapt to this. Humanity adapt hazardous. We are We are one blackout away from a mass casualty event in most of these areas. They're running out of water, running out of cooling. People suffer greatly. How people that are maids will live outside, people that are homeless, how they're able to survive during this. This is uh, some pretty big news coming out of these uh, protests that have been going on that I've been trying to wrap my head around lately. That, uh, Students have been taking to the streets to protest against poor road safety. It was uh, two students that were killed by a speeding bus in the capital of Dhaka. They started forcefully stopping vehicles and checking until the drivers had licenses to drive. So high schools across the country are closed 
university across the country are closed. Internet access in Dhaka has been cut. It is Bangladesh's capital. We're seeing a disturbing amount of reports of students being targeted and attacked by machetes, by non-lethal ammunition. It is a massive breakout of violence. Thousands of students armed with sticks and rocks have clashed with armed police in Dhaka as the Bangladesh authorities cut some mobile internet services to quell protests against civil service hiring quotas. At least seven people, 17 people died during clashes at protests across Bangladesh on Thursday, local media reports, as authorities blocked mobile services across most of the South Asian country. Internet providers also cut access to Facebook. Protesters key organizing tool. More on this later. Still an evolving story. A lot of information, it's a lot of chaos. Well, there's a lot of videos I can't show, it's not my content. But there's a lot of violence. A lot of people being injured greatly. On purpose. Due to them being protesters. What are we doing if we're not going to allow best and brightest even protest peacefully. Use weapons on them, tear gas, 40 millimeter rounds, shells. What are you doing? Why? You want to make the road a safer place, right? They're taking matters into their own hands. Trying to stop unsafe drivers and I'll press them down for ID. The government has their chance to do the right thing. Now the government is tripling, quadrupling down on its efforts to quell the protests. That includes cutting mobile internet, cutting Facebook. Terrible to hear, and especially how many people that have died. Kenya was not that long ago. In Bangladesh. Struggle. Society. More on this later. Anthropocene six mass, ex six mass extinction event predicted to be worse than previously thought. This is the six mass extinction what we are currently faced with right now? We're seeing a great loss of biodiversity across the planet. That's Stunning scientists and experts. In their study, 
reported in the journal Biological Reviews, Catherine Finn, Diana Daniel, and Shira Benoso, and Florencia Rola analyzed population trend data for more than 71,000 animal species to learn more about declines. Over the past several decades, it has become clear that global biodiversity has been declining due to human activities, including conversion of habitat, use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and more recently, climate change. It is not known how many species are extinct due to such activities, but scientists have been trying to track species at highest risk of disappearing. They found that 48% of species have declining populations and just 3% have rising populations. They also found evidence showing that 33% of species currently classified as non-threatened on the IUCN red list are actually spiraling toward extinction. Amphibians are seeing the greatest drops in population. While they found declines for birds, mammals, and insects, they found it was less severe among reptiles and fish. More on that later. As fish are going to be seeing a huge a threat when it comes to coral reef bleaching. We can see in the northeast United States and the Gulf of Mexico and around the world seeing great huge pockets and stretches of coral reef bleaching and moves the sickness around the world causing for a reef to give up its colorful algae, make them bone white. Because a bleaching in coral reef is heat stroke in a human being. The coral reef can recover if allowed to. But with what we're seeing here in these temperatures, with these rolling bleaching alerts, have little to hope for when it comes to huge portions of our coral reefs around the world surviving. Say some 30 to 50 percent affected or more. It's just such a great number that how can we not be in the sixth mass extinction already? Six mass extinction already about understanding that we're losing species at an alarming rate. It should have started when we lost the passenger pigeon. In a flock of billions, the passenger pigeon used to be king of the skies. But due to habitat loss and overhunting, passenger pigeons, which used to be in the flocks of billions, no longer a common occurrence or existence anymore. We lost a huge indicator species and that should have been where all the questions started is why did passenger pigeons ex go extinct? They were in the billions. We can't imagine a species going extinct but it happens and it has. Alaskan snow crabs as well Two years in a row, catches have been called off due to incredibly low stock, to the point that it's very difficult to find any. We're running out of time to understand this, because actions that we do, like ocean trawling, ocean trawling is where we take the giant nets with the weights on them and go run that across the bottom of the ocean. Well, carbon dioxide that is kicked up out of its place on the ocean floor 
ends up in our atmosphere in nine to ten years. You take that all these aggressive crawls over time. There's going to be one year that's going to be a huge spike of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And we're not going to understand why, because it's literally just going to come out of nowhere. It's going to screw our whole carbon budget out of, of planning. Because all these area, all these areas of like war, disaster that happen, that put a lot of carbon, a lot of metals in the air. We're running out of time to understand how long even a war lasts. We're still dealing with munitions from World War II being detected. War is hell, and it never ends. Scars last forever. We're still seeing news such as unexploded ordnance being found in places. This is two unexploded Second World War bombs have been discovered during work to widen the A-20 motorway near Rotterdam. 500 pound bombs were found near a railroad bridge in Borgeretsch by surveyors checking the site for unexploded ordnance. They did not pose an immediate danger, but will have to be removed before work starts. So let's see, November 16th to the 17th, bomb disposal experts will remove them from the site. I hope those are the only two that are on site. It just seems uh, curious. We're finding remnants of our past, pretty much. What are we going to do? As we widen, as we expand our societies further into the wild, we're going to find all these little treasures of previous uh, undoing. Thank you for joining me in this stream. If you haven't already, please follow me on Twitch. That's where I'm primarily going to be streaming live. If you're watching us on, on YouTube, you're watching the recording that I uploaded onto YouTube. As of YouTube causing uh, great distress to me, they suspended my ads account, demonetized my account. Now you can see like this is the majority of the content that I've been doing is what you're listening to right now. Can't remember maybe one time that I swore a bunch, but I mean, I, I, I've been reassured that swearing isn't just going to be what is considered as shocking content for YouTube to ban my account, uh, ban my, uh, and definitely suspend my ads account, demonetize my account, and make it difficult to Appeal. I've tried appealing, but it looks like YouTube's eliminated the option for me to appeal because from 10 years ago when I created the account, I made it as an organization for reasons I don't remember. 10 years ago, it's a long time ago. And uh, what I did. I knew I needed to change my account type to an individual. YouTube won't let me do that. I've contacted them, they won't let me do that. Because if they let me do that, I'd be able to properly appeal, and they probably don't want to do that. My YouTube account was being flagged with shocking content and circumventing systems. Um, not sure the circumventing systems I assume is has to do with it saying organization 
and me not being an organization, but I tried explaining to YouTube that I'm not an organization, I'm an individual, I need to have this changed so I can appeal. Because otherwise, if I'm an organization, I gotta have legitimate papers that I have can submit to YouTube or Google as legitimate business. So I'd have to create a one greater business and uh, <laughs> that might be a way, but I don't know if YouTube is worth it anymore. YouTube has uh, several times my uploads flagged in as 18 plus age restricting, which is basically, you know, the death of a video before it gets out there. I uh, try to stay away from shocking content and I, I mainly do not swear. My streams doesn't just doesn't happen. I might say some words carelessly, but never enough to the point that it's like shocking content and that YouTube needs to lock me down. So, fortunately, I am starting over on Twitch. Fortunately, I do not mind Twitch. Uh, I do appreciate your time and I do appreciate your viewership. If you haven't already, please click the follow button on my channel. I would appreciate it greatly and it motivates me to keep me going, keep me uh, curating stories for people. I just, you know, I can't imagine like having fans, but mainly doing this as a service to people that want a more of a, a voice that Curates a lot of these stories that might slip through the cracks. Otherwise, I do have a Patreon. I changed my tier. Three dollars is what I call the headliner tier. It's three dollars a month. If you appreciate what I do here, if you appreciate the news that I bring, and uh, that time that I invest in here, if you, if you get anything out of it, I greatly appreciate if you would go to my patreon.com slash one great earth and click the membership button. Take time to have my call outs, like call out John and Michonne. Thank you very much for being a headliner. I greatly appreciate your support. I'd also like to throw out a shout out to Ashley, Sarah. Thank you so much. Your support means a lot to me. All right. Well, it's Friday. This is a pretty late stream in the day, uh, in the evening. Usually it's later in the day when I stream. I try to aim for a 5.30 window p.m. Eastern. Didn't happen today, but still happy to get on here and make a stream. So until next time, I probably will not be doing a stream on Saturday or Sunday again. Um, just have to build up more news for Monday then. If you haven't already, again, please, I appreciate it greatly. Click the follow button on Twitch. Follow me on Twitch so you can catch my next streams when I go live. Thank you again. Please take care.